<laughs> yeah, I'm still pussing out. <clears throat> when you drink that many tequilas, yeah. Well, think about it. We've been open for uh, about five years, and I'm drinking about two a week or more. <clears throat> By the way, if I happen to die early, does anybody want my liver? <laughs> it's been sanitized. All right, you guys ready for the next comedian? Yeah. All right, big Muskegon welcome here, people. He was the 2005 Chicago Comedian of the Year. You heard him on Bob and Tom. He's from Milwaukee. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Lucky, Dobie Maxwell. Yeah. All right. All right. Yay! Thanks, Ken. Give Ken a little bit of love, if you would. Drinking tequila on the job. That's a good job right there. Your liver must look like a hockey puck, man, after five years of down and that stuff. Bobby St. Clair was doing a great job for you. He's here. Give Bobby a little bit of Michigan love. There's my map of Michigan right there. God bless you. I've been in Rossi's before. You guys are always nice. I'm going to work harder than an ugly stripper for everybody in here tonight. If you've never seen me before, Mr. Lucky, that's my luck of anybody you've ever met in your entire life. I don't know what it is. It's a curse, a jinx, a hex, a whammy. Call it whatever you want to. My grandpa gave me my nickname. I'll never forget. I was nine years old. And he looked at me and said, with your luck, if it was raining whores, you'd get hit in the head with a queer. <laughs> That's a hell of a thing to hear when you're nine years old, you know? <laughs> I had no idea what he was talking about, you know? What's a queer, Gramps? Ask your scoutmaster. <laughs> What's a whore? Ask your grandma. <laughs> that is my life in a nutshell, and I'm the nut. <laughs> Every day of my life, just trying to make a dollar out of 59 cents. Everybody in here has got luck, too. Where you're from, that's part of your luck. Your hometown is something you never can change. Wherever you go in this world, people say, where are you from? And if you say Michigan, if that's where you're from, they give you the map of Michigan. And, oh, Detroit, they make cars there. Grand Rapids, there's Amways from there. Yeah, and Gerald Ford Museum. And I'm from Milwaukee, right across the lake. You been in Milwaukee, Wisconsin? Oh, oh. That makes Muskegon Heights look like Hollywood right there. <laughs> You better know what? Yeah, beer, cheese, Lenny and Squiggy, Fonzie, Jeffrey Dahmer, and per capita, Milwaukee has the fattest people on the face of the earth. <laughs> Gravy is a beverage in Milwaukee. <laughs> Everywhere you look, big, fat, beer drinking, cheese eating people with big, fat, beer drinking, cheese eating pets in their house. <laughs> Ring a doorbell anywhere in town, you'll see goldfish with the cracks of their ass showing. <laughs> They're farting bubbles sinking to the bottom, scraping it on the rocks. They opened a Hooters there. Can you believe that? Hooters in Milwaukee. They should have called it Udders is what they should have called it. Who oh, am I? Mr. Lucky, do I get the pretty waitress ever? Can I get the cute one just one time to come to my table, do a little flirt and get her phone number, have a date, do some fun stuff? Don't ever go out to eat with me, because we are not going to be doing any flirting. I guarantee you that. I always get that one waitress. You know the one I'm talking about? It's her first day on the job. The place had a hire They'd get sued. You know what I mean? Doesn't know her ass from apple butter. Got the growth with the hair sticking out over here. A witchy way eye and a bad wig and ir Irritable bowel syndrome, one leg shorter than the other, and a chicken wing, and a snaggle toe, and a steel plate in her head, and gingivitis, and whooping cough, and buck teeth, and vaginal warts, and mumps, and rubella, fibromyalgia, and a stutter, and a twitch, and that's the one that I get every time. How does that work? Because I'm in her section. Of course I'm in her section. No matter where I sit, I'm in her section. I am the victim of cosmic sodomy. I swear to God, I am. No matter what I do, the purple pecker of the universe perpetually up the poop chute. All I'm asking for is a refill on a Diet Coke. Is that too much to ask for? Apparently it is. Because everyone, every time I ask for who brings it to me? 467 pounds. Doris the Porcosaurus shaking her big ass over to my table with those orange shorts. They're going to pop like a parachute on a dragster as she bends over to pick up a french fry and ass cheek shrapnel goes flying everywhere. You can't fit three
fit in a two pound bag. That's what my grandpa told me. <laughs> At that big orange triangle on the back, like a tow truck that beeps when she backs up, and <laughs> scraping her ham hock thighs together, making sparks, starting forest fires, bringing me chicken wings and a Diet Coke and a garbage can lid. I am happy to be at Rossi's in Muskegon, Michigan after that, <laughs> brothers and sisters. Now we're going somewhere. Let's get this party started in here, man. I got no place to be. Hey, can we have a little more smoke on stage, too? It's always nice to get cancer at work. I appreciate that. <laughs> Honk up a tumor the size of a bacon bit. That's like, <laughs> That's your birthday cake down there, man? It's your birthday? Happy birthday. Kind of, that's a, you cough and you got, you got lung, lung rot disease. <laughs> but the miners in West Virginia got cleaner air to breathe down there. But I like it. You guys are nice people. It's always good to have Christmas lights up in March, too. That's always nice. <laughs> this is a great place, man. I like it here. I don't care what anybody says. I'm, oop, could be gas. Thanks for checking. I appreciate that. <laughs> Mention my name, you get a good seat. <laughs> My grandpa used to read, boy, that's a guy thing. Every guy in here knows what I'm talking about. He would walk in there with a Sunday paper. He'd come out Thursday afternoon. <laughs> what the hell you doing in there, Gramps? And he comes out, holy shit, I don't know what he was doing in there, but we got to call a doctor or something. <laughs> Say the same thing every guy said, I wouldn't go in there if I were you. <laughs> Gramps, the Marine Corps would not go in there. Then what is it? It lights a match like it's supposed to smell better after that. Hey, thanks, Gramps. Smoke my favorite. <laughs> Texas Mesquite barbecue flavor. I like it. You guys are a good audience, man. I appreciate that. Please drink a lot and tip. Try one of those burgers. That sound really good. I'm on the road all the time. I don't get a chance to eat good. I think I'm going to have one after the show. Because it's pretty cheap. Nice, you know, five bucks for a big old hamburger. Because I'm on the road. Every place I go to has got a slogan, you know. Every fast food joint makes me sick. Burger King. Dumb slogan. What is it? You heard it. Have it your way. Yeah. I don't know about you. My way would be free of charge. That would be my way. <laughs> we can't do that, sir. It's my way, damn it. <laughs> All right, plan B, I'll help you out. Serve it between Cindy Crawford's boobs. How about that? <laughs> Put my Whopper right there. That's where I want it. Next to those two vanilla shakes, and here's 39 cents. Supersize them while you're at it. <laughs> That's a happy meal in my book. <laughs> Taco Bell, make a run for the border. Make a run for the... <laughs> That's what it should be. You know that run I'm talking about, you know, that, whoa, okay, whoa, oh, yeah. A lot of arm action, no leg action. Go to Vegas, that's the loosest slot in Nevada right there, boy. There she is, little kitten back from the sandbox. How you doing there? Could you hear me in there? I could hear you. You got to eat some grape nuts or something. I don't know what it is. Oh, relax, it's all right. Taco Bell, make a run for the border. Here's a hint. Next time you go to Taco Bell, sleep on your stomach that night, boy. If you don't, you'll be floating on your couch at about 3 o'clock in the morning like a hovercraft. What the hell's wrong with you? I dropped the chalupa, if you must know. I was in Taco Bell in Chicago. I saw a Mexican guy trying to pay his phone bill in there. Taco Bell, thank you very much. There's a Polish guy behind him going, hey, hurry up, they're getting ready to shut mine off. <laughs> Chinese guy behind him, I'm in the wrong joke. I just want runch. Runch, thank you, all right, good. KFC's got two stu stupid slogans in there. First one's been around 30 years, man. Finger licking good. That's disgusting. I expect to see people having so much fun, they start licking other people's fingers after a while. <laughs> All that licking going on, that's why they don't call it San Francisco fried chicken. <laughs> They'd be serving corn dogs in there. <laughs> and the colonel would be a rear admiral. <laughs> Good sodomy joke for the nice folks of Muskegon, Michigan. How the hell are you guys doing there? Good. Nice to see me, isn't it? Have you been here before? 
twice. Well, you should know what time the show starts, shouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, man. As a penalty, you will be staring at my pasty white ass the rest of the show <laughs> until the band gets out here. They're good. What's it, what are these guys? Off the record, yeah, they're good, they're good. Last time I was here, I think they were here too, man. I love music. If it wasn't for the Columbia House Record and Tape Club on a false name and address, I wouldn't have the music collection I have today. <laughs> That's a great way to do your Christmas shopping every year if you haven't done that, you know. I think Jeffrey Dahmer would like 10 CDs for a penny. I think so. <laughs> then you get that nasty mail about a month later. Have you forgotten to make your payment? Oh, I guess I have. Sneeze, wipe, flick. <laughs> Cat scratch fever, yeah. They got the big speakers out tonight, too. This is going to be like a KISS concert in here. This will be fun. I can't wait, man. I got stuff happening to me, man. I watched my first porno last week. I couldn't believe that, man. I couldn't believe how skinny I was. <laughs> but look at me, what, what the hell? You're, what, you're nuts, man. You're out of your mind. I am broke as the Ten Commandments. Anybody else? God, I got a stack of bills on my dresser about that thick. I'm afraid to open. I think you know the stack I'm talking about. Everybody in here has got that mail. There are bills in there. I don't even open them anymore. I don't know. I don't have the money. I let them ferment on my dresser for about 30 or 40 months, hoping the places I owe money to go out of business or something, you know? <laughs> And that nasty trick mail starts coming in, you know. This is not a bill. Well, thank God for that. <laughs> then I open it. That was the envelope. This is the bill. <laughs> what does that work? How about this one? Final notice. Good. Stop sending me those, will you please? <laughs> you sent me one six months ago. Did I pay it? Uh-uh, no. <laughs> Sent me one every month since then. Uh-uh. Last month, here, sneeze, wipe, flick, right there. <laughs> Thank God I'm a finalist in the $10 million Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes, man. Ed McMahon is going to waddle his drunken butt up to my front porch with the bikini babes and the helium balloons and the, the prize patrol, you know. And that was coming with that big old check, you know, it's the size of a piece of drywall. How the hell do you endorse that thing? With a paint roller? What the hell do you do? That, I don't know about you, $10 million bucks. Do you ever think about what you do with $10 million? I think about it every day, man. I don't know about you. I'm, I've been busted my whole life. I'm going to piss it up a rope as fast as I can. I'm not going to save a nickel of that. First thing I'm going to do, take a cab on vacation. How fun is that going to be? <laughs> I'm going to hop in the back of a cab with a stack of $50 bills. Where to, buddy? How about Six Flags Guatemala? How about that? <laughs> Turn left at Holland. Keep this piece moving south, man. Right down 31, turn left somewhere, I don't know. I would go out to eat at the airport on purpose. That's the kind of cash I would have. 12 bucks for a corn dog. Buy one for everybody. I, I would never again shop at a garage sale. You ever shop at one of those yard sale? What do you call it here? Yard sale? Garage sale? Sale, that's what they should be called. There's one thing worse than shopping at a garage sale. Having your own. You ever try that? It sounds good in theory, doesn't it? Just like communism. Looks great on paper. No one's been able to pull it off just yet. It sounds good. Oh, I got some extra stuff in my house. I bet I could use extra money if I sold it. How about if I take the stuff I don't need and bring it outside at 6 o'clock on a Saturday morning and sprinkle it all over my front lawn so I can use it as bait. And I'll attract every inbred hillbilly, cousin humper, chain wallet, piece of low-life wrestling fan, bent over, hunchback, snaggle shit tooth, ass-picking, malignant, bent-over, unbathed, grimy sh**. And I mean that in a friendly and a customer service kind of a way. <laughs> Just in case any of those nice folks are with us here tonight. <laughs> yeah, let's let those mongoloid window lickers from the short bus come limping across from the trailer park like Night of the Living Dead with a, a Velcro wallet full of soggy dollar bills. And let's let them rifle through my sh** of the past 25 years and try to talk me down in price at 6 in the morning. That's exactly what I need in my life. Hey, a catheter with a Red Wings logo, how much you take for that? <laughs> Woodwork squeaks and out come the freaks, man. I can find them anywhere. That is my life, a freak fest. 
There's one place worse than shopping at a garage sale. That's the outlet mall. You ever shop at the outlet mall? Birch Run's got one. Every place I know now has an outlet mall. Scratch and dent, factory second, sh they should have burned 10 years ago. <laughs> Till some genius says, you know what? If we put a food court around this people will drive down from the UP and buy and there's two words you never want to see when you're shopping. Take it from me, right? Slightly irregular. Okay? <laughs> Nothing is slightly irregular. It that's what it is, okay? I'll give you an example. If McDonald's sells hamburgers for two seventy five for a good a Big Mac for a good one, would anybody in here pay a buck seventy five for one with a couple of bites already out of it? <laughs> no, he wouldn't. It's just like the outlet mall. Frying pan, handle on the inside. <laughs> Three-piece bikini, purple, size 52. <laughs> Unless you're from Milwaukee. <laughs> then it's snug. <laughs> they tried to sell me a computer with a stutter. Would you buy one of those? It's 30 bucks off. You got to give it a shot. Plug it in. Turn it on. You've got m m m m m m m m mail. <laughs> Goodbye. A cell phone with a rotary dial. <laughs> Can you hear me now? No. Jeans, three bucks. That's a great price for jeans. That up. I'm in charge. They're always messed up. I tried them on. Okay, what could the slight irregularity possibly be? How about the pocket over the crotch? How about that? <laughs> yeah, it could be that. Maybe that third leg shooting out of the ass. That might be it. <laughs> Walk around like a snuffleupagus or something. <laughs> Dragging it low. All right. This is it, man. You guys are all right. I'm staying over at the Super 8 Motel. I don't want to brag, ladies, but I'm in the handicap room, you know? <laughs> That's too lucky. I always get the handicap room. You ever get that one? My toilet is six feet off the ground. I don't know whether to take a dump or get my bangs trimmed when I'm sitting in there. <laughs> swinging my legs from reading that comic book and some horny trucker's Viagra pills kicking in in the room next door. I can hear everything, too. There's paper-thin walls. Put the tailgate down, mama. Daddy's bringing the payload home. I gotta hear that. There's a lot of good-looking women in Michigan, man. I don't know what it is about the other side of the lake. They don't make them over where I'm from, boy. Cute ones are. There's some cuties in here tonight, boy. I might not be good-looking myself. I'm the cutest one in the burn center. That's about the best I can do. <laughs> I've been single so long. I opened up my refrigerator yesterday. Mrs. Butterworth is starting to look sexy, you know? <laughs> I'm sitting around in my underwear. <laughs> Sex is everywhere. Men, we don't need to be reminded of sex, but we are. Every time you turn on TV, gorgeous babes on the commercial, in the magazine ads, hot chicks everywhere. Now it's online. I don't, there's sexual advertisements every time you sign on the internet. Ladies, I don't know what you get in your email because I'm not a woman. Guys, every guy in here gets this one about 35 times a day. Add six inches to your penis by Thursday. <laughs> what the hell am I going to do with seven inches? <laughs> Be like a radiator hose from a 74 Monte Carlo, you know? <laughs> Stop suffering from premature ejaculation. I don't suffer. <laughs> Women suffer. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that's not suffering, that's time management right there. <laughs> I gotta get to Rossi's, man. I got my English leather cologne on, that's right. And Batman underwear. That's right, Batman underwear, ladies. You should see the spot Robin's in now. <laughs> it's laundry month at my house. You know what kind of pressure that is? You ever been in the laundromat with your last clean clothes? That is the ultimate embarrassment, man. A few months ago, I was down there in my Boy Scout uniform. That's all I had left. <laughs> A couple months before that, graduation cap and gown. 
Nobody washes dishes in my apartment. I got roommates, you know, four or five guys live in one place. I don't even know how many guys are there. Bunch of bedrooms. I'm on the road all the time. Nobody washes dishes. So I get home, there's a big stack of dirty, crusty dishes in the sink, man. Last, yesterday, I wanted to get some some orange juice. There were no clean clean glasses. Had to get my, my go to my closet, get my Yahtzee game out to find a clean cup to drink out of. <laughs> Sit around, shake, shake, drink, shake, shake, drink, dice. <laughs> of course, I put the Yahtzee cup on top of the dirty dishes, so now when I go home, I'll have to get the Monopoly game out, start doing shots out of the thimble. <laughs> it's always problems, man. I had this luck, even when I was a kid. I'm the only kid I've ever met in my life that has gotten a big wheel stolen. Did you ever, get, did you ever hear that? <laughs> Why the hell would you steal a big wheel from a kid? That's like tipping over a wheelchair saying, I kicked your ass. <laughs> the cops showed up and everything. What did it look like, Sonny? It's a damn big wheel. What the hell do you think it looked like? No, I rotated the tires. The big one's on the back, stupid ass. <laughs> Some Mexican kid's got a low rider. I don't know. What I don't know. It's always problems for me. I was a little brother, too. Actually, I still am. I'm not a little brother. I'm a younger brother. And I, I was the baby of the family. That's the worst, man. Little brothers, we have the hardest of any kind, any member of the family, including the dog, boy. It's downhill for the little brother, and payday is not Friday. I'd ask little brothers in here to raise your hand, but you're probably having a flashback right now. You're afraid to raise that hand because you know someone's going to grab it and stick it behind your head all the way until every, every muscle pops and give you a wedgie in your shorts and smack you around a little bit and knee you in the about 50 times and give you a glass to drink and tell you it's Mountain Dew. <laughs> I wish that was a joke. Everything that came on TV when I was a kid was a how-to whip a little brother's ass. Wrestling would come on. I hated that show because every, every hole that they did in the ring on the show was going to happen to me about five seconds later, you know? Getting the pile driver off the garage roof. Ow. Yeah, that hurts. Little sisters, there's probably some little sisters in here. Little sisters, you get some abuse, I will say that. There's some abuse. But little sisters have the secret magic weapon. That's the tears. Ooh, little sister, when you start crying, daddy will protect you. Daddy, he's hitting me and it hurts, make it stop. <laughs> daddy will come out with his newspaper under his arm. He is judge, jury, and executioner. Oh, come on, what's going on here? That's your sister. Look, she's smaller than you. You made her cry. You're happy with yourself. Now cut it out. You had your fun. That's enough. The game is over. And the game is over. Little brothers, we start to cry. What happens? We get it harder. That's what it is. Oh, well. I'm sorry, Grandma. I'll eat your bunt cake. <laughs> I have an older brother that's two years older than me, an older sister that's four years older than me, and I'm the baby. And when I was a kid, that's, it's hard for little boys especially. Two years was a lot. I could not whip my brother's ass. He was bigger. He was older. I knew it. He knew it. Every kid in the neighborhood knew it. Every kid at school knew it. That should be enough. No. Big brothers, you're bastards. I don't know why. He had to prove it every damn day. I don't know what the deal was, but he all every day, he'd jump out from behind the garage after school or behind a tree or somewhere where there was nobody else around. I thought, oh, God, here it comes. Every day, he'd tackle me down on my back, and there's nothing I could do about it. And he's kneeling on my chest. Then he would grab my arm when I'm laying there, and he'd start whacking me in my own head <laughs> with my own arm. That's how horrible is that? And he's asking me the whole time, why are you hitting yourself? Quit hitting yourself. You're a dumb <laughs> Quit hitting yourself. <laughs> And I'm hitting myself, and, I, and he's asking me why I'm hitting myself, and the mistake that I always made was I answered the damn question. <laughs> Bad news for a smart ass. Why am I hitting myself? Because Orca the killer whale is kneeling on my chest, you big fat tub of pig. That's the wrong thing to say. If you are a little brother, because if you've been there before, you know what comes next. The dangling spit yo-yo. You been there? <laughs> 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 up and down for another hour and a half. <laughs> that bastard just ate a whole bag of Oreo cookies ten minutes before. <laughs> it looks like the La Brea tar pits. <laughs> 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 
I told my brother, I said, you're older than me, you bastard, and if God is fair, I hope he is, that means since you're older, you're going to die before I will. So someday, you're, I'm going to stand over your open coffin and go, bleh, bleh. why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? Why are you kicking yourself? Your leg came off. Then the games got worse. I did not invent the games that happened when I got older, but I had to play them against my will. Slug Bug, one of my least favorite games. You ever play that damn game before? Now, I'm a little bit murky on the rules. Could you please help? Maybe Michigan style was a little bit different than Wisconsin style. Now, where I'm from, a slug bug means a Volkswagen drives down the street, and the first kid that sees it has to yell, slug bug, and whatever color it is, slug bug red, and then the other person that didn't see it first gets hit. Where I get a little bit fuzzy is, where do you get hit and with what? Could you please explain that to me? <laughs> Anybody? Slug bug, where do you get hit? In the arm and the shoulder with what? Fist. So to the face with a baseball bat is not how you guys play. I got screwed again. Slug bug. Oh. Oh. I hated that game, especially when about nine years old, our family, true story, we moved about three blocks away from a Volkswagen dealership. There was about 387 slug bugs on that damn lot 24 hours a day. Every time the old man would drive the car past the damn lot, my brother would see it. And the rule was, I didn't invent this rule either. That's what, the first person that sees more than one slug bug gets them all, and you get to get hit that many times. So it was like a windmill down in Holland. My brother, slug bug! And I'm spitting teeth for about three and a half weeks later. And all I wanted to get was revenge. I'm thinking, I, I, I can't beat anybody up. I'm the little one. I got to use my brain. That's all the little brother wants is revenge. And I got it, too. Nine years old for Christmas. I got the best Christmas present a little brother could ever get. I got Battleship by Milton Bradley. Ever get that game? <laughs> Not electronic Battleship. I mean regular red versus blue plastic American Battleship. Yeah. Did you do what I did to piss off the older kids? You didn't even put your boats on your side of the board? <laughs> That is the happiest half hour of any dysfunctional childhood. <laughs> Sitting at the kitchen table at 9 o'clock on Christmas morning, miss. <laughs> and they would keep hunting after every hole. That's the best part of it, too. J10 has got to be it. It's the last one. And about 10 seconds later, the, why are you hitting yourself, Gilligan? <laughs> I was always getting into trouble. I didn't even want to get in trouble with, man. We had, we, uh, in school, in sixth grade, we didn't get school lunch until sixth grade where I went to school. Did you have school lunch in Muskegon? Was it good or was it bad? Nasty. What's that? Horrible. Horrible? Did you have the, the, those sloppy joes that when you peel it apart, it looks like a baby's diaper? Did you have to eat those? How about the rectangular shaped pizza with a grease puddle right in the middle? Did you have to eat that? Mystery meat? How about that? What was it? We don't know. Some critter just ran under the slop sink and we out of it with a broom handle. We just threw it in the pot. We didn't really look at it. We had the sh and then we had the worst dessert. Now, I can take a bad meal in sixth grade. What are you, 12 years old? Give me a good dessert, damn it. It's not that hard to please a 12-year-old kid. What would it be? A chocolate chip cookie about that big. That would be a great dessert. How about brownies with frosting that thick? That's another one, too. They started giving us weird concoctions I'd never even heard of before. One of them was called spring plums. I have never heard of this before or since. You know what they are? Every I traveled around the country. I asked people when you went to school, did you have to eat spring plums? They were prunes is what they were. The only school system in America. Mr. Lucky, sixth grade, never had them before or since. They're two shriveled up purple nasty little prunes and they were in a little styrofoam bowl and they had purple gooey syrup in them. Around. And they were sitting there and, and we saw on their menu spring plums and we looked at it and said, spring plums, we never had that before. Then we saw them, it was the spring of what year? 1776, we're not gonna eat that. 
and we just threw them all away, and it was no big deal until a week later when we got them again. Then it was every week we got them once a week. Then it was three times a week. Then it was every damn day after a while we're getting these damn spring plums. First thing we did was change the name. We didn't call them spring plums very long. We called them what we thought they were, dead man's balls. That's what we call them. <laughs> that one's got a vein in it. Don't anybody touch it. They're disgusting. <laughs> Not one kid in our whole school ever ate a dead man's ball. But we got them almost every damn day, so we had to make a use out of them. And that's what we did. We took them out of the styrofoam bowl that they came in, out of the syrup. We wrapped them in a napkin. We put them in our pocket, and we smuggled them outside for recess. We, there's a recess after lunch, and we had a busy street right next to our playground. And we'd take our smuggled dead man's balls, and we'd wait for the nicest, cleanest, shiniest cars to drive back and forth. And, and we, we'd take our dead man's balls and sp splash out of them against the side of a car. When you're 12 years old, there's no bigger thrill than to take a projectile object and to splatter a moving car with it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what do you usually start with, especially in a, in a place like Michigan where it snows? What do you start with? Snowball. That's exactly right. And there's no, that's a great thing. And to throw a snowball at a moving car is an art. See, it's not just any car that you want to hit. It's got to be the oldest bastard in town, no doubt. <laughs> 87 years old or above with pants above his nipples and hair coming out of his years to filter out rock and roll, driving a 1967 Pontiac Bonneville with a blinker that's been on since Escanaba, you know what I mean? <laughs> And his prune wife named Myrtle trying to get the AM radio dialed into Paul Harvey. That's the bastard you want to hit. <laughs> Bulletproof bifocal glasses and a big red gin blossom waiting for that car to come around. We got our snowballs. And there's two thrills that happen when you hit the old bastard with the snowball. Thrill number one, actually hitting the car with the snowball. That's thrill number one. Thrill number two happens about 10 seconds later, which is... Brakes, and then what happens? You hear the brakes. It chases you. Yes, that's exactly what you want. That, see, it, they're chasing you. That's what makes it so much fun. You know, that makes Battleship look like baby when you got Fred Mertz with a pants running through a snowbank, you know, all out of breath. You damn kids, I'll call the cops on every damn one of you. <laughs> that is the greatest thrill in the world for a 12-year-old kid. I never figured out, why did they get so pissed off? It's kids having fun, old man. What the hell difference does it make? It doesn't hurt your car. It's over in two seconds. Who gives a <laughs> Then, many years later, I drove a car myself. <laughs> And I got hit with a snowball. Has that ever happened to you? It's a whole different story, isn't it? It's the middle of December, and there's snowflakes wafting out of the sky. I was driving to the mall to do my Christmas shopping. My mind's a million miles away, you know? Christmas music wafting through the stereo. Fa la 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 la, la la la. <laughs> that comes out of nowhere, man. I gotta drive right to the car wash, because I just my car. That's what I did. <laughs> ah, that's why they got so pissed off when I was a kid. <laughs> I get it now. But for this story, I did not have that information yet. All I had were two dead man's balls in my pocket. <laughs> And there were no snowballs. This story is a true story. It happened in June. There were about two days left for the end of the school year. And, and I had my dead man's balls. And I was a left-handed baseball pitcher. I had the best arm of anybody in the school. So it was my job to stand at the corner of the fence. And the fence didn't come that much higher. So I stood in the corner, and there was a stoplight across the street. And there was no turn on red because it was a stoplight. So it was my job to wait for the cars to pile up at the red light. I would pick the car that when the light turned green, that I would hit with the first dead man's ball, and 587 of my closest friends would hit the car with theirs, and it looked like the side of the Grateful Dead tour bus with purple tie-dye looking and it was a beautiful thing. So I'm standing there to make a long story longer like I usually do, and the cars are lining up. And about six cars back at the red light, there was a white Cadillac. I will never forget it as long as I live. It looked like Boss Hog's Caddy, big, long, white, shiny Cadillac. Beautiful. And I said, in my infinite wisdom, to this day, I don't know why I picked that one, we're going to hit the Cadillac. And the kids are like, no, we can't. That's a Cadillac. We'll get in trouble. I'm in charge. We're hitting the Cadillac. So cosmic sodomy's kicking in. Oh. Here it comes. 
So the light turns green, and all the cars come in front of the school, and sure enough, there is the Cadillac right where it's supposed to be. And here I am with my dead man's ball in the stretch position, and I kicked my leg as high as I could, and I threw it as hard as I could, and it was such a beautiful sunny day, nobody, including me, noticed that the driver's side window on the Cadillac was down. <laughs> you see where this is going, don't you? I don't know where my guardian angel was that day. He's picking his ass, flying around with one wing in a circle. I need some help now, ass bag. No, no, no. Mister, I threw that thing as hard as I could. It was such a beautiful day. Uh, no, it was, it was, uh, I don't know how I got that thing on an angle. You know, uh, 35 miles an hour, moving car on an angle. I got inside a moving Cadillac, 35 miles an hour, directly hitting the lady driving. Right in the head. Bam. Lee Harvey Oswald would have given me a marksmanship certificate. <laughs> Had he, it's a one in a billion shot. Her head went back and to the left. <laughs> she hit the brakes on the caddy and she went up on the top of the curb and almost caused a 27 car pile up right in front of the school and I was standing there shaking like a three-legged dog. Peach pits going through heroin withdrawal. <laughs> That would be horrible luck for anybody in this entire place, anybody except me, because it's always worse for me. I don't know what it is, man. Guess who was driving that Cadillac? The principal's wife. <laughs> Do not. Mrs. Bachman, that was her name. And she, she had just come from the hair salon, I found out about t 10 minutes later, and she had a brand new $37 Chia Pet Buffon hairstyle, <laughs> which now had half a dead man's ball splattered against the side of it. <laughs> And she was pissed, man. She, she got out of that car. Who threw the dead man's ball? 587 of my closest friends who didn't throw theirs are all pointing at me right there. That happened in sixth grade. I still have four more weekends of detention I haven't served. Man. I'm still it. I still have girl germs. I still got cooties. Trolling? Nobody? Nobody's on a date. They must be married. Two people married, nobody's dating. What are you guys here? Yeah. Are y'all eunuchs? Is that what happens? You're here for government cheese to look at the band or something? I don't know. Trying to bond with you, man. Every time I go someplace, I have to learn. Now, we only grew up, you know, it's about 50 miles. If it was across the water, you got to drive around the water. But people talk a little bit differently. We didn't grow up that far apart. But everywhere I go, I notice people speak a little differently. Sometimes it's a pronunciation of a word. Now, help me out. In Muskegon, do you say roof or do you say roof? What do you say? Roof. roof. Do you say root or do you say route? What do you say? Route. Do you say envelope or do you say envelope? Is it creek or is it crick? Creek. Creek? Crick. Is it ant? Is it aunt? Ant. Ant. <laughs> wherever you go, it's a little different. Some places have a different word for the same thing. Now, do you say grocery bag or is it grocery sack? What do you say? Bag. bag. Is, it, is it a teeter-totter or is it a seesaw? Teeter-totter? Seesaw? Are there any words that are just Michigan words? I can think of one. Party store. No place else in the world has a party store. I see the sign, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be great. I walk in there, it's a Middle Eastern guy selling beer and cigarettes. That's what it was. That ain't a party where I come from. There you go, tweeter. <laughs> Is that a shitter or a dumper? What is that in there? <laughs> so the party store. Now where I'm from, a bubbler means something. Anybody know what a bubbler is? Nope. No. Really? It's a drinking fountain. Where I'm from, that's what a bubbler is called, a drinking fountain. There's other places in America that a bubbler is something else. It's, it's a bong. You guys know what you're thinking? Thanks, Cheech's girlfriend. Appreciate that. <laughs> You could have said that, yes, some places in America, a bubbler is a bong. Now, I had no idea. The first time I was 500 miles from home, I walk up to some guy that looks like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, you know? <laughs> Obviously a doper, whatever, that's fine. I, don't, I think it's a drinking fountain. I said, buddy, can you tell me where there'd be a bubbler around here? <laughs> yeah, dude, I got one in my car. <laughs> you got a bubbler in your car? <laughs> what the hell do you drive, a health mobile? You got a... <laughs> I'm picturing a drinking fountain, you know. What do you want it for, dude? I'm like, I want to get a drink of water, dumbass. What do you think? <laughs> you don't want to drink that water, dude. <laughs> 
Now, do you say ATM or do you say cash station in Michigan? What do you say? ATM. ATM. You know what it's called in Milwaukee? A time machine. It's, a, it's an acronym, T-Y-M-E. It stands for take your money everywhere. I didn't invent it. That's what it's called where I'm from. I was a 1,000 miles from home. Walk up to a total stranger, broad daylight. Buddy, can you tell me where there'd be a nearby time machine around here? <laughs> Did you try the mothership that dropped you off? <laughs> it's a space cadet bastard. What are you, Michael J. Fox? <laughs> Now, Michigan's got some weird laws. Did you know this? In the state of Michigan, there is a law that says if you go to a restaurant at any restaurant in the state of Michigan and the restaurant has a salad bar, you have to do something if you want a second helping of, of salad. Anybody know what you want? What you got to do? A clean plate. That You have to take a clean, fresh plate. But there's a law about it. My question, were there problems before I got here that you had to make legislation about? Was it that out of control? People were coming over the Indiana border going bare ass in the cherry tomatoes or something? <laughs> I don't think I need to be doing jail time on a salad violation. That would suck. <laughs> I am not a badass, you know. I'm not, I picture myself walking around the prison yard. Hey, man, what are you in for? I killed ten people with an ice pick. What about you? I put some chocolate pudding on a dirty plate at the Ponderosa Steakhouse. <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> well, grab your ankles and welcome to Jackson, buddy. What's your partner in for? Oh, he ripped the tag off his couch and mattress at home. <laughs> See him? He taped a football game without the express written consent of the National Football League. <laughs> That's our leader, Lefty. He played jarts in his backyard last summer. Remember that game, jarts? Lawn darts, you cannot have them anymore. They are illegal in all 50 states. When jarts are outlawed, only outlaws will have jarts. <laughs> You will pry them from my cold, dead fingers. Have you ever seen them before? They're big, giant darts, and you're supposed to fling them underhand, and you get them in a little circle, a hoop, and you get points. But people didn't do that. You know what they did. It was a 4th of July, and they're gassing up on strows, and Uncle Chester, go deep. <laughs> they're launching those bastards about 65 feet in the air, you know, <laughs> putting a dolphin blowhole in their Uncle Chester's head. <laughs> And about six beers later, they start throwing them overhand, you know? I never liked you. <laughs> and you got to admit, there is nothing funnier than to watch somebody you know get hurt right in front of you. I don't know why that is. <laughs> That's human nature. It's totally true, man. Grandma's running for a bus with two Myers bags full of and slips on something, bounces her head off a fire hydrant. She's laying there twitching like a lobster out of the tank with her depends full of piss and her dentures out and she's twitching. And she, oh, call an ambulance. I'm hurt. It's like, what is the first thing you do? You laugh your ass off. That's what you do. Oh, not till I change my shorts. Then I'll call the ambulance. That's mean. That's human nature, man. My grandma's 93 years old. She turned 93 a couple weeks ago. I love her to death. She's very patriotic. Her brain is still sharp. My grandma had an eagle tattooed on her left breast for World War II. It's a pelican now. <laughs> Perched on a bowling pin. <laughs> She's 93 years old. What the hell do you expect, man? She got the 710 split action going down there, you know? <laughs> I don't know. I think if I do have a soulmate, she's hiding from me. She's probably living in some third world country, working at some Walmart sweatshop, making six cents a month, you know? Just... That's the kind of girl I like, because she would like me just for me. And I have running water. Washy, washy. Yeah, it's just... You're my... Hey, keep it going for Ken. Give Ken a big round of applause.
Love drinking, man. Love some yay or much. Love to drink. My problem is I drink too much. I don't know when to quit. I can't just drink, catch a buzz, and stop. I'm gonna either. I gotta drink much throw up. That's my cutoff point for the most part. But I think I had more fun drinking when I was younger. You guys remember drinking when you were in high school? Was that more fun back then? Yeah. yeah. You had to lose in those days, didn't you? You gotta work hard to get drunk in those days. You gotta find someone to get you the booze, find a place to drink and hide it afterwards. You worked your ass off to get drunk in high school. Now you're over 21, you walk into a bar, you order a beer, you drink it. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like when I was a kid and I couldn't get beer, I'd break my father's liquor cabinet, drink all of his vodka and rum, and then fill the bottles back up with water. Like that. Did you do that too? Did you get caught? No. See, I never got caught. We're sneaky, sneaky, aren't we, man? I never got caught either, man. Parents never said a word to me all these years. Been out of the house for over 15 years. Thought I got away with it all this time because it was never brought up. And the truth came out last Christmas. And my folks came to visit me for the holidays and they said shit right back to me. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. I didn't think it was very fucking funny. But, oh, man. You do stuff stupid like that when you're younger. Because when you were younger, everything meant, everything was different. Like, birthdays were all milestones when you were young. Remember that? 16, you got to drive. 18, you were an adult. 21, you drank legally. 25, your insurance rates dropped. And then downhill, nothing from there. <laughs> nothing until you're 50 when you get the big fat AARP discount. That's all I slept to look forward to. And when I was 16, dumbest thing I ever did in my life. 16 was my year to drive. I couldn't wait. Got in trouble. My father actually caught me drinking beer for the first time two days before I turned 16. That's how damn stupid I am. Dad sat me down and gave me this long ass lecture before he took me to DMV too. Sat me down and gave this long lecture. I didn't listen to a word he had to say. I'm a teenager. Went in here, came out of here. And he knew I wasn't paying attention because he wouldn't take my word on the fact that I would never drink and drive. My father actually made me sign a contract swearing I would never drink and drive. It's based on a program they've had in high school for the last 40 years. They still have it. A program called the Contract for Life. And if you remember this thing, it was a real contract you signed with your folks. Said right on it. If you ever got too drunk to drive, you can call your parents up at any given hour of the evening. Tell them you're drunk and they had to come pick you up. No questions asked. <laughs> Bull f That's what that means. <laughs> I thought it was real. I just wanted to drive. I said, sure, Dad. I'll sign your stupid contract. There you go. Something in the back of my mind, I'm never going to call my dad a drunk. I'm not that dumb. That yeah, lasted about a year. That's how stupid I am. A year later, I'm 17. I think I'm a man. Go to a party one night, got drunk and shit. Drank so much I passed out. When I woke up again, it was like four in the morning. All my friends had left me at the party. So I'm drunk, I don't have a ride home, I'm way past curfew. I know I'm in deep shit at that point. That's when I had that moment of clarity. That's when I realized, wait a minute, I'm not in trouble. I signed a contract. <laughs> According to that contract, I call my dad right now at four in the morning, wake his ass up. Tell him I'm drunk, he's got to get out of bed, get dressed, drive over here, come get me, and not ask why. <laughs> Bull Because <laughs> I was stupid enough to call his ass. That's how drunk I was. Picked up the phone, I said, hey, Dad. <laughs> hey, Dad, you remember that contract we signed? <laughs> Check this out, Dad. I did my part. <laughs> Can you come get me now? Of course, thing, the next thing he asked the obvious question, where are you? And if you've ever been that drunk in your life, you know damn well, that's not an easy one to answer sometimes. <laughs> oh, shit, I don't know where the hell I was. I said, what, where am I? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but that was a local call, if that helps you narrow things down a little bit. <laughs> so I'm glad you guys were laughing, because he didn't find it very fun. But he had a plan. All good dads have a plan. My dad, this is my dad's plan. He said, all right, son, we're going to come get you. Did you want a cordless phone? I said, yeah, dad. He said, here's what I want you to do. Take that cordless phone, walk out the front door, wherever you are. Walk outside, look around, describe to me in detail what you see. And based on that, I'm going to come find you. I thought, OK, that's cool. I'm drunk. I'm young. But I signed a contract. He came to me. I said, I'm going to have some fun with it. As well. So I went outside drunk and said, all right, Dad, I'm outside. <laughs> wow, Dad, I'm looking around out here and not seeing a whole lot. There's a lot of trees over here in the back. Hold on, look on this side. No more trees over here, Pops. This isn't looking too good. Wait, there's the moon. Does that help? No. All right. Hold on, Dad. I'm still looking over here. Wait. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on, Dad. I see something right here. This should help you out, too. All right, Pops? Pay attention. Okay, right now, 
I can see your car. <laughs> I can see mom's car. I'm next door, Dad. I'm sorry about that. I'm not just right there. Oops. <laughs> well, you guys, I'm an idiot. I love this job. I got a great job. It's like the best job I've ever had. I travel all over the country, tell jokes, meet really cool people, smoke their pot. I love this job. I really do. But uh, Ken was talking about the military here. Let's get started on that. How about a big round of applause for our military? You guys just need a shot. Doing a fantastic job fighting the war on terror overseas, I must say. Doing a great job. Not getting the respect they deserve, and that pisses me off. I don't care how you feel about this war. If you're against the war like a lot of people are, that's cool. You're entitled to your opinion. But shit, all the troops come home safely and then bitch. That's all I ask. That drives me crazy, man. I hate that. Because I understand, man. I, I understand that every time the military does anything wrong and ends up on the front page of every newspaper in this country, that pisses me off. Because we have no idea what the hell's going on out there, what they're going through to be able to judge them. Because I remember last spring, man, of 04, big story broke out in Iraq. Remember that big prison review story? Remember that? They're abusing prisoners in Iraq. Oh my God. I said, oh, so what? <laughs> they're the enemy. Because I look at it from the soldier's point of view, and I understand. Because I'll tell you what, if I'm out in a field fighting and guys are shooting me to kill me on a Monday, and then on Friday I'm responsible for the same guy's well-being, <laughs> I guarantee you being part of the Naked Pyramid is going to be the least of his troubles that weekend. I promise you that. <laughs> Just no respect, man. God, it gets on my nerves. And our military is doing a fantastic job. They've caught our terrorists. They're catching them. But I remember the first terrorist we caught after 9-11. It wasn't the military that got them. It was a bunch of guys in the plane. Remember our first terrorist caught after 9-11? Richard Reed, the shoe bomber. Remember this jackass? The shoe bomber. Idiot. This guy was a moron. He had one job to do. Shoe bomber's job was to get on the plane and light a shoe on fire. That was it. The dumbass couldn't even do that right. Now, I don't want him to blow the plane up. What kind of dumbass can't light a shoe on fire on command? I've done that by accident, drunk at a bar before. It's not tough. <laughs> this guy was powerful. Didn't even know he had the power he's got. Because of Richard Reed, we all have to take our shoes off at the airport now and get on a plane, am I right? Yep. Because of one guy. Why couldn't he be the thong bomber, man? Why? Why? <laughs> I'd be hanging out at airports every day for that man. I remember uh, the big guy we got last year, Khalid Mohammed, the number three ranking al Qaeda leader, busted his hairy ass. If you remember this, this picture in the paper, he wasn't a really hairy guy. He was, he was wearing that tank top and he had the fur. Uh, uh, if you're that hairy, God bless you. Wear some sleeves, man. I don't want to see that. And all we're going to do with his Wookiee is we're going to throw him in prison for the rest of his life. Interrogate him every once in a while. That's too easy. Now, I think we ought to make the punishment fit the crime. Make an example of one of these assholes. We can end terrorists. We ought to take Khalid Mohammed and have a big party. Invite about three, 4,000 people. And have a lottery. The three, 4,000 people that are there. And all the winners of the lottery get to come up on stage. They got him sitting on a stage so he can't move, tied down. And you get to walk up on that stage and pluck out a handful of body hairs at a time. Until he's smooth all over. And then we make him sleep in Michael Jackson's bed for a couple months after that. <laughs> That'll stop terrorism fast. Because you might be, as a, might be a Muslim on Monday, but you'll be Catholic by the weekend. I promise you that. <laughs> Terrorism's changed everything, man. I fly all the time. I hate flying in the summertime. Hate that. When I got my tan going, I look like a terrorist. People stare at me. And it makes me, I feel sorry for those guys, for like the good Muslims that wear that thing on their head, that towel looking thing on their head. Because there are a lot of good Muslims out there, and I feel bad for them. Because I don't care how liberal you think you are, if you get on a plane and the guy sits down next to you, he's got a towel on his head, we'll pucker up to a level nine. I promise you that. I promise you. Because I'm flying next week, and I know I'll take it too far, man. But I'm going to show up at the airport with a towel wrapped around my head and watch the fun begin. Get on the airplane, get up and go to the bathroom like 19, 20 times during the flight. Come out of the bathroom once, go, <laughs> Just to watch a plane full of people in their pants at 30,000 feet. Because, damn it, that's entertainment to me right there. What kills me, the ultra-liberals kill me. Be liberal, you're entitled to that, but I hate the ultra liberals. They're the ones saying that we should be nicer to the terrorists we have in Cuba. We should be nicer to them because they're just lost and dysfunctional people. Half this country is lost and dysfunctional, we're not nicer to each other. Why be nice to a terrorist? 
Now look at this one, I'm proving it. How many people buy applause come from a dysfunctional family? Where are you? Clap right there. 80% of you guys just clapped when I asked that question. Which tells me that 20% of you guys are sitting with family right now watching the show. You guys are smart, man. You guys are math jokes. You get a fat, do the math. Good for you. Hello, I'm Ken Ferrier from Port City Property. In today's market, there's a need for a different kind of real estate company. With the people losing their jobs in West Michigan. It's very normal. It's weird being a comic, not being from a dysfunctional family. My mom and dad have been together for 40 years. They're still married. They're cool people, man. It's just amazing to me that I come from a normal family and end up being a comic. But you can look at my mom and daddy's lap. They do look funny as a comic. They do. I swear, if you saw them together, you'd get Because my mom's like five foot tall. Boop, right there. My father's like 6'10", way the hell up here. Never understood the attraction between my mom and daddy. And then one day I got old enough to figure it all out. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to think about your parents having sex for like one second. That's disgusting. It is. And I can take it a step further than that. This is a true story. Last summer of 2004, I caught my mom and dad having sex at their house in their pool. <laughs> yeah. Scared. I had to go to therapy over that one, man. I didn't even catch him having sex either. I they don't live at home or anything like that. It just kind of happened. I was coming home from a trip. I had to drive by their house to get home. Been on the road for a couple months. I'd be a good son. Stop by and see my folks. Didn't call first. If I can give you guys any advice, I'm going to give it to you right now. When you ever go visit your mom and dad, call them first. Let them know you're coming. Because you have no idea what kind of your parents truly get into. I found out the hard way. Get to my parents' house, nice Sunday afternoon, both cars in the driveway, very cool, their homes, I pull up, park. Get out of the car, walk up and knock on the door because they won't let me have a key anymore. <laughs> no answer. I'm thinking, all right, their cars are there, they went for a walk or something. So I'm going back to my car to go home. Before I got in the car, I hear noises coming from the backyard. Like sexual noises. Moaning and groaning. No way, man. There's no way my parents are back this shrug, and they're old. They're in their 60s. God, they've been married this long, they're not. There's no way, man. There's no way. They got there's a pool back there. Maybe they're sleeping. Yeah, I was wrong. Because <laughs> I walked in that backyard and holy sh**. I walked back there and the first thing I saw was my tall father behind my short mom. Pulling her hair with one hand, smacking her ass with the other. Talking poor all the way through. I don't know what freaked me out more about that. The fact that I saw my mom and dad doing that, or I realized that's the thing, same thing I do in my pool with my wife, man. That was... <laughs> True story, man. Last summer, my best friend in the world came out of the closet. Had no idea this guy was gay. I've known him my whole life. He used to be married. He's got a couple kids. Last guy in the world you'd ever think was gay. And he tells me first of all, people, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I used to be the biggest homophobe in the world until I heard it. It's amazing how you react when you get thrown in the middle of it. I have no idea. And he tells me first. I'm sitting at home watching a baseball game. Phone rings. I pick it up. It's like, hey, what's up? And I said, oh shit, what's going on? He said, hey, what are you doing today? I said, I'm watching a movie. Why? He said, well, I need to talk to you, man. I said, all right, well, we're on the phone. Talk. He said, no. I need to talk to you in person. I need to look you in the eyes when I talk to you about this. I thought, oh, shit. He wants to be serious. He wants to come over to my house. He, said, he wants to come over to look me in the eyes. He wants to smoke my weed or borrow money from me. It's got to be one or the other. I had a good week that week. I was like, come on over, dude. And I gave him credit, man. He came over. He didn't bull around about it. He came right out. We're sitting there, we crack open a couple of beers. He goes, Bob, I need to tell you something very serious. I said, what, man? What's up? He goes, no, you don't understand. It's really important I tell you this first. I'm a boy. I said, dude, you're making me nervous, man. Where are you going with this conversation? Did you kill someone? He said, no, nothing like that. And I said, well, damn, dude, spit it out. Get it over with. Just spit it out. And looking back on things, that probably wasn't the right thing to say to him. But I didn't know where he was going with the conversation at that point. I said, spit it out, dude. He goes, all right, Bob, I'm going to tell you this, man. I said, what? He goes, Bob, I'm gay. Holy shit. Like, gay happy? <laughs> he said, no. I said, like, gay two guys naked in bed gay? And he said, yeah. And I went, ugh. My first reaction was a question. I said, why? Why the hell are you gay? You were married. You've got kids, man. Why are you gay? We chase women again. So I don't know, Bob. I just woke up one day and realized I was gay. It happens. It doesn't happen like that. That's a random gene right there, isn't it? I don't mind gay people anymore. I just 
want that gene coming to my house in the future. That scares me. I love women to death. I want to wake up one day next summer craving the cock. That fears me, man. I fear that big time. Because there's no Hallmark card like that. I didn't get around that. So we talked a little bit more. I thought it was easy with the subject. Because he asked me for advice, and that was weird. He said, Bob, uh, you're pretty cool with this. I need some advice. I said, dude, I don't know what the hell I can help you with. But go ahead. He said, well, you, you know, you get up in front of people all the time. How do I come out of the closet? I said, how the f do I know? I don't put my shoes in the closet anymore, man. He goes, well, no, you talk to people on stage. I said, yeah, man, but I'm telling jokes. You gotta tell your family you're smoking pole. That's a whole other show right there. <laughs> yeah. I thought about it for a little while. I was like, well, he must have come out. I didn't want to lie to his parents anymore, man. I, he wants to tell his family he's gay. That's cool. I said, look, man, you want to tell your people you're gay, use your head about it. Don't call them up one at a time and tell them you're gay. You're Catholic. You got a big family. It'll take you forever. I said, be smart. Wait till Christmas this year. <laughs> they all get together at your parents' house. You just got to get up and say it once. Uh, if you haven't figured this out by now, I'm an asshole. <laughs> but I showed up for Christmas at his house last year. I couldn't miss out on that. <laughs> I'm a comedian. It's in the contract. God damn. I did. I showed up, man. Sat down right next to him. He sweat bullets. I looked at him and I said, God damn, he's nervous, man. He goes, yeah, today's the day, coming out. I said, yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I said, how about a little heads up when you're going to make the big announcement? He said, well, I thought about this all week. and figured the best time to tell everyone I'm gay, I'll have everyone's attention, is when my dad finishes saying the prayer. Oh. Holy <laughs> shit, man. you got to wait until your dad talks to God in front of your whole family and tell people you're gay. Fuck, you're going to do it that way. I'm going to go outside and smoke a joint because I can't be sober for this shit. They went outside and smoked the joint. Made a big mistake. Smoked the whole joint. Because let me tell you, good people, Muskegon, there is such a thing as being too high. I hit that plateau that evening. I got so damn high when I came back in the house, you could have blindfolded me with dental floss that day. <laughs> cool. I was just looking for pot smokers on that line. A lot of you guys laughed. Right. We need to talk to that after the show. Those words, I came back in, man. And all I could do to not laugh. Because I'm stoned. Everything's funny to me at this point. I come in and this whole family, there's like 40 people sitting around the table just talking, laughing, smiling. I have no clue what's about to happen. And I'm just trying not to laugh. Because so I'm looking at them going, <laughs> oh, you guys keep having fun. You fuckers have no idea what's about to happen. <laughs> but I want to ruin this moment, so I kept my mouth shut. And he did just like he said he was. His dad gets up, says a prayer, gets to amen. He jumps up and steals the show. He jumps up, looks at his family, goes, family, I love you all. I'm a homosexual. I'm passing mashed potatoes. <laughs> and it got quiet, man. Everyone's eyes popped out of their heads, mouths hit the ground. And there's my stone ass on the floor, crying like a little girl. Because <laughs> I've never laughed so hard in my life, man. I think what amazed me the most was how fast that laughter stopped. Because that's when I got up and sat back down. That's when it dawned on me that I was his guest at the table that night. <laughs> my player. I'm going, hey, whoa, whoa, look at the wedding band, man. Come on now. I'll put my grandma right in front of everybody if I had to. I like the coops. Don't even think about that shit, man. But we're all cool about it now, man. That's what he is, you know. So I, we don't, I don't necessarily agree with it, but that's his lifestyle. That's his choice. He'll have to answer for it later. It's not my problem. And I told him, man, I said, you do what you got to do. I actually did something this year. I'm very proud of him. I would have never done this in a million years. But I wanted to let him know I support him as a friend. I wouldn't just talk. So I actually showed up and hung out with him on his turf one night this year. Yeah, went to my first gay bar this year. I did. A little gay bar in Virginia Beach called Nutty Buddies. <laughs> you guys laugh. I'm not making that. There's really a gay bar there called Nutty Buddies. And I had a good time. I'm not going to lie. Now, besides me, how many guys in this room have been to a gay bar before? Don't lie. I'm not going to make fun of the guys. Just like that, okay. All right, you got a gay bar. You guys are straight, right? Yeah. So you know who you are. You can have fun with anyone. You just drink it. It's not like you go in there and film a movie or anything like that, right? You can have fun. It's not like you're going to go into a gay bar and get caught up in the atmosphere and change teams that night. I'm like, wow, I'm having so much fun, I'm not leaving here until I saw you. No, sir. That's not how it works. You know? I had a good time, man. Learned two valuable lessons hanging out at a gay bar, too. 
Two lessons that every man should have to learn. First lesson I learned is that when I go to a gay bar, I drink for free. <laughs> That's the best one. Second lesson I learned, I learned what it was like to be hit on by a drunken, horny man. <laughs> Ladies, allow me to apologize for every drinking, horny man in this room tonight. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had no idea it was like that. I've never been on that side of the table before. I I'm in the bar. I'm just trying to have fun. Guys who come up to us left and right buying me drinks. I don't turn down free drinks. So I'm drunk. I have like 12, 13 drinks. I'm hand shit. Then it got weird again, man, because that's when my friend's gay posse showed up, his gay friends. <laughs> They all showed up and they're happy to see me like, oh, Bob, you're here. I said, why wouldn't I be here? They go, we don't get many breeders in here. Just call me then. <laughs> He's like, breeder, now what you are? I said, no, my name's Bob, faggot. I called you by your name. Show me some respect. It's weird, man. Because they wanted me to go dance with them. They're like, Bob, come dance with us. I said, those are solid gold dancers on the dance floor. I bring my jacket, I'm gonna sit back here and chill, you girls go have fun. <laughs> so they went up and danced, left me alone. Big mistake there. <clears throat> Cause ladies, I feel your pain now. Cause ladies, they all get together and go out and get girls night out. They'll get up and all go dance, but one of them has to stay back at the table and purse control, am I right ladies? <laughs> that lady becomes a target, it's like, yeah. Same as the gay bar, only a little different. Cause I'm sitting there by myself, all those guys leaving. I made eye contact with this guy on this side of the bar. I didn't mean to make eye contact with him, it just kind of happened. I'm looking around the bar going, this has got to be the cleanest bar I've ever seen in my life. Oh, shit. <laughs> this music sucks, but I can walk around. I look over here and he's sitting there. I look at him, he looks at me, and some magic happened I didn't realize happened. <laughs> some magic that Walt Disney couldn't create himself. <laughs> drunk as shit at this point, and I looked at him and I gave him like a one-handed wave. I didn't even tell I was drunk, I looked up at him and he looks at me and I just kind of did one of these. Didn't realize this was some kind of gay universal sign to come to your table. Because <clears throat> he got up and came to my table, came up, sashayed over to my table. Feet weren't even touching the ground, looked like flying nun was coming here all of a sudden. Flamboyantly gay, right out of the closet, stereotypical too. Came over, hey, how you doing sitting over there all by yourself looking all pretty like that, aren't you? Damn, look at you, and holy sh. You got the biggest feet I've ever seen in my life. And you know what big feet means, don't you? I said, yeah, because I like my wife from behind, that's what it means, pal, all right? Don't get any ideas, pal. People sometimes. He was cool. He's like, I understand. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. Can I buy you a drink? I can buy you a drink. That's cool. But look, just because you're buying me a drink doesn't mean I'm going home with your ass tonight. So you better learn that shit right now. I got to tell you, it felt really nice to be able to say that to someone else. <laughs> I'm shot down with that line a few times myself. I can't lie. <laughs> it's all about tolerance, is my point, man. I realize hanging out with them, gay people are just people like we are. They just have sex and really f <laughs> But you know, to each their own. Because I realize we keep hating gay people like we do. One day they're going to start hating us straight people and it's going to suck. It's going to suck for us. Because you know damn well, in this state too, in Michigan, you get a lot of rights in this country. You know damn well, it's not too long before you see a gay hate group having a parade in Lansing. The Capitol, a big gay hate parade. The gay KK marching for their rights. <laughs> The KKK don't want white sheets either. And the KKK is fuchsia from head to toe. And they're not cheap sheets either. They're like 800 count sheets at that. <laughs> See, like that, I didn't know what that meant before I heard it. Did a little story behind the joke. When I wrote the joke, I didn't have that line in it. I actually called my buddy up to let him know I was going to do this joke, make sure he was cool with it. I said, dude, look, I wrote a joke at the, at the gay bar. I want to make sure you're cool with the whole thing. He's like, well, tell me. So I told him the joke. He said, that's a funny bit. I like what you say behind it. It's a good joke. He goes, just do me one favor when you tell the joke. And I said, sure, what? When you tell that joke, you talk about the gay KK sheets. Make sure you say they're 800 count sheets. And I said, why? What does it mean? He goes, don't worry about it. If you say that line that way, I promise you that women will laugh at that. And if a guy laughs at that joke, don't let him buy you a drink after the show. <laughs> If you're only going to be there for two years, then I would say no, because you, it's hard to recapture 
that kind of money in only two years. Hello, I'm Ken Ferrier from Port City Property Exchange. We started this company about eight years ago to save people money on commissions in order to sell their home. Many. We want to make sure you bring a big uh, Muskegon welcome to our next comedian. You got to welcome him big to the stage. And when the comedy gets done, please go back and say hi to the comedians. He's a, I, and the single most important rule of all is to keep your conversations down. So please, respect the comedians, respect the people around you, and keep the conversations down, but enjoy the show. He's appeared on HBO. I think she wants the show. Hold on. All right, he's appeared on HBO, Showtime, Comedy Central, and the Bob and Tom. He's a regular on Bob and Tom. He's from Cincinnati. Please welcome to the stage, Steve Caminiti. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Big hand, big hand right there. Big hand, big hand for all our veterans and, and military guy. And big hand for Tony in the back. Big hand for Tony back there, that sick bastard. Well, all right, well, how you people doing? Woo, Woo boy! Saturday night in Muskegon. <laughs> Woo! Hey, to HBO, wham, straight to Muskegon, all right. Who knows what's next? Maybe Fruitport, all right. Like people are going, like people are like, hey, don't be making fun of Fruitport. <laughs> So this is nice. This is, I think, is my third or fourth time here. I come here every time. I get completely hammered. I love coming to Rossi's. And tonight, I called ahead, and I cleared it with Rossi. When we're done, right before the band, when I'm done, we are going to lock all the doors. We're going to bring in some midgets. We're going to bring in some trampolines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to hose everybody off. We're all going to strip naked, jump into a pile. It's wild in here. Oh. Yeah, naked midgets, hell yeah. I know, I'm not gay, but I paid 10 bucks to see a naked midget. I'll be laughing my ass. I'll be like, woo, do a table that you come on. <laughs> All right, some of you people aren't picturing it. <laughs> you're going to have to use your imagination when I'm up here because you're sitting out there enjoying your show, and all of a sudden a midget comes, that's a midget. And then your friend will be like, and he's naked. You're like, that's a naked midget. <laughs> then when he whips his wiener out, even if it's like a two and a half inch, it'll look huge because he's a midget. <laughs> This midget had a big <laughs> <laughs> See, now you're picturing it. <laughs> yeah. I like coming around here. I like the naked people. I like the strippers. Y'all like the strippers? Yeah. Look how quiet I got one guy. <laughs> you guys still got the skanky ones, man. <laughs> I've been to both of them, man. I've been to Murphy's and the other one that they're naked. They're completely naked. But yeah, yeah. I got all <laughs> balls walking in there like, ooh, that bitch is nasty. <laughs> You guys got the skanky one. All right. Woo, here's 10 bucks. Leave that shit on. <laughs> I saw, no, I swear to God, I saw a pregnant stripper over there. <laughs> hey, don't groan on me. I didn't. Her. <laughs> it's the same way when women and men watch strippers. Men and women watch strippers completely different. Like, here's a couple of guys watch strippers. Here's guys watch strippers. <laughs> huge and your friends like yeah I know and for like a dollar you can get them on your head and you're like that is a deal they should have that everything's a dollar store it's always something like that I just completely forgot what I was talking about that tequila just kicked in I got a lot of problems man I drink tequila I smoke pot and I got ADD <laughs> I know anybody with the ADD <laughs> look they already forgot the question <laughs> Bad, especially if I get high. I have no idea what I'm doing anytime, any day, anywhere. Here's a great ADD joke. You know when people with ADD takes a screw and a light bulb? Look, a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you are going, what? What's he talking about? <laughs> anybody, does anybody really have it? Does anybody get high and have the ADD? That's horrible. Especially if you accidentally get high during the day. You should see me just trying to leave my house, all right? All right, I'm going to go somewhere. I'm just trying to try to find my keys. All right, all right. I gotta go find my keys. I know they're here because I drove here. So you're looking around your place, you're wandering around aimlessly, you're like fucking in your, you're, you're in your like, you know, your kitchen, you're like, where are my keys? You're like, you know, you go in your bedroom, I can find them. You're like, oh, I'm in the bedroom. Might as well walk back in your living room. You're like, oh, I love this movie. Watch the whole movie. 
<laughs> I have not seen this movie, my favorite. <laughs> Seriously forgot what I was talking about. Anyway, I'm from uh, Cincinnati, uh, but the last couple of years I've been living down in Houston, Texas. Anybody been down to Houston? <laughs> Two people, all right. I had to move out of Houston, not because I wanted to, because I had to, because I had an LSE, PBFH. Anybody have one of those? LSE, PBFH. Low self-esteem, psycho bitch from hell, I burned all Look at the women clapping. You probably deserved it up there talking about You are a pervert. Psycho bitches, you out there, be proud, psycho bitches. Come on, ladies. Look how quiet I got. Now, who remembers the 90s? Like three people. You're looking up, you're going, you're a Muskegon, the 90s ain't hit here yet. <laughs> I've been around here a lot, I know. It was 1996, that's where the psycho bitches came out of the woodwork, and I'll tell you what happened that year. That was this year this woman named Alana Morissette came out. You know who she is? Yeah, yeah, women love her because her very first song was a song about getting dumped. Do you remember the song? The song was called You Ought to Know. Everybody remembers the song because they played it eight kajillion billion times and you got sick of it. But in the song, after she gets dumped, this woman sings, Will she go down on you in a theater? She gets dumped and she sings that in her lyrics. Will she go down on you in a theater? Now I hear this on the radio, I'm thinking, Sh <laughs> Will she go down on you in a theater? There's no way I would have dumped her. <laughs> I'm like, that to me is a good quality. <laughs> I'm like, I want to go see the Lion King again. <laughs> Hakuna Matata, woohoo! <laughs> I got a good idea. Toy Story just came out. I got a Buzz and a Woody. <laughs> now this guy, he got that one right there. Buzz and Woody. Slinger Woody. Anyway, I'm living down there with a the psycho bitch and she wanted to get married. I told her I couldn't marry her because I'm Italian. Any Italians in here? No. <laughs> All right. All in the witness protection program. Like to see that. In the South, we're not Italian. No, we are in the South. Italian. That's how people say in the South. They say it. Some people around Michigan do. Are you Italian? Oh, but ding dong, you do look Italian. Can you talk Italian? I love when them people talk Italian. Say something in Italian. I'm like, look, lady, I don't know any Italian. Come on, say something in Italian. I'm like, all right, get in the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> get in the f <laughs> I know one Italian joke. You want to hear it? Yeah. You know why Italians don't like Jehovah's Witnesses? Why? Hey, Italians don't like no witnesses. <laughs> Drum roll. <laughs> no Italians in here? No Italians? Jehovah's Witnesses here is how it is. Do they have them in Muskegon? Do they have them around here? They're everywhere. Every state. And I hate them. I hate them bastards. I don't care. They do suck. I'm with you. Bastards. They early. And I drink a lot. And I work at night. And when they come at like 7.30 in the morning, you know, you're sleeping, all of a sudden you hear your doorbell, you're thinking it's some kind of emergency, so you jump up and you run out to the door, then you see him through the door, you're like, oh, <laughs> it's the Jehovah's Witnesses. But then you don't want them to see you, so you're like really moving real slow, and you're like ducking down in your own house, and you're like trying to get back to your room, you're like crawling back, you're like, yeah, I do it, I don't care, I hide from them. And they're persistent. They don't go away. They're looking in the door. They're like, I can see you in there. And I'm like, it's the cat. It's the cat. All right. We do have comedy here every Wednesday, every Friday, and every Saturday. Uh, and, of course, on Wednesday nights, we usually have... We can <laughs> Woo! Me and one Muskegon enthusiast over there. Woo! Should I know anything? If anybody's celebrating anything tonight, I should know about offhand. Anybody celebrating a birthday, anniversary, parole, period, something? <laughs> you guys, you guys hunt up here too. You got to. I like going hunting though because I go with my dad, and my dad thinks it's great that I go or whatever. But I don't, I don't go to hunt with. I, I, I call it like sharing like quality time with my dad. But it really is just drinking like a gallon of Jack Daniels and then sitting somewhere alone in the woods. Is that hunting here too? I think it's the same everywhere in Michigan. My dad's like, fight. he goes, uh, if you shoot something, fire your gun again so I know if you, you know, I know to come help you. And I go, if you hear my gun go off, that means I've had an accident. <laughs> I'm going to be passed out down here by the pond, so if I accidentally trigger something, make sure you check on me. <laughs> 
like the hunting, it's fun. I, uh, this is important about me too, uh, 10 years sober right here, 10 years sober. And uh, then I turned 11 and said, what the hell am I waiting for? <laughs> there is a lot in my life I don't want to remember, I'll tell you that. My friends say this though, my friends try to get all philosophical when they're drunk, do you guys know what I'm talking Laura, man, dude. <laughs> How you act when you're drunk, how, when you're wasted, how you act, that's the real you deep down. The real you comes out when you're up, man. Has anyone else heard this? Does this not scare the shit out of pretty much everyone in the room, I'd say? I say things that even I don't understand when I'm drunk. Does that mean deep down I'm, I don't know, uh, retarded? Or Spanish? I don't know, I can never understand the Spanish. And I hate drinking alone, that's why I got pregnant. Cause it's a family tradition. Woo! Sorry, I'm on like 80 Red Bulls right now. I feel like I'm having a cocaine breakdown or something up here. That's great. You guys drink the Jagger bombs up here? Oh yeah, we do. This table's gonna be blacked out naked and fighting each other later, that's good. Let's, hear, let's team up Jagermeister with cocaine. That's what you're doing. Just make sure you have a video camera because you're not going to remember what happens tonight. You're going to be like, did I piss me or did she piss me? I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay, maybe you guys don't party that hard up here. I'm sorry. I, I have wrong meeting. Uh, I smoke the pot too. I smoke the reefer, as my mom calls it. Where's my pot? I'm sorry, where are the cops here tonight? Cops, make some noise. This one up. Uh, where are the cops here? <laughs> yeah. That's unfortunate because I want my pot back, please. I, you got it on the way here. I know you have it because you took every pound of it. <laughs> I, lo I love smoking pot though because I, I don't see anything wrong with it, you know? I just don't. What's the worst thing? They know your name at Taco Bell? I can live with that. It's not something that's kind of view on life. But I'd come home when I was in high school and college and my mom would say things like this to me. She'd be like, oh my God, Laura, what's going on? Why do you have to smoke pot? What's going on? Why can't you just drink? And I'm like, what? Uh, pot and alcohol are two different animals for me. Two different animals, two different things for me. Like who here has had a crazy night smoking pot? Uh, pretty much no one. I mean, I, uh, well, was it paired with drinking? I'm saying the most violent thing that I'm doing when I'm stoned is I'm pretty much laughing myself to, to you know, cartoons and I'm passing out, waking up at four in the afternoon and I'm fine with that. <laughs> I'd come home though when I was like high in high school, you know, or you know, I'd come home when I was in high school and my mom would get me at the door, clap if that's ever happened to you when you were growing up, huh? That's something fun, something you'll never forget. You thought you were tricky, you thought you were gonna be all sneaky. You do the same drill either, you know, when you're a kid coming home to your parents or if you're coming home to a spouse. You get out of the car real quiet shut the door with your hip real gentle you get out of your car you're walking up to the house going up to the door yeah you unlock the door get in there all the lights are off you feel good the dogs and shut the door lock it and as soon as you're like oh boom all the come on and there's your mom standing right there in your face staring you down and my mom's saying things like this to me what the hell's wrong with you? Your eyes look funny. And you smell like your father. Are you on drugs? Are you taking the weed? Are you on that reefer? And me, queen of the comebacks, this was my response. Mom, who still says reefer? What f***er do you think it is? <sighs> ah, women can vote now, Mom. It's awesome. <laughs> I, I don't know. She'd be so mad at me, though. And I'd come home and I'd be drunk. She'd be so, she'd be like, Laura, you know, you know, why, why, you know, that's fine. Drinking is great. And I'm like, well, uh, I have a problem with it because I'm way crazier when I drink. You guys, yeah. We're a little bit crazier when we drink. We don't know what we're doing half the time. We don't care. And I was like, well, she's like, well, give me some examples why it's so different, you know, than pot. You know, why, why is alcohol different? So, you know. And I was like, well, okay. Pot as opposed to alcohol 
has never made me uh, pee on my neighbor's dog because I thought it was funny. <laughs> it was a 4th of July party, you guys. That wasn't even funny. There was like kids and balloons everywhere. <laughs> it's never made me try my car key in the front door for an hour before I realize it's open. <laughs> yeah, it's a screen door. There's not a lock on it. That's, that's my kind of drunk night out. It's never caused the morning after pill. You go, Pot, go. Rock on. I'm always happy when the ladies laugh at that because I know I'm not the only whore in the room, so thanks for coming out, ladies. <laughs> Be proud. Be proud. I like that. I like a... I think it's so funny because my grandma was like, Laura, you don't know how good you got it. Back in my day, we didn't have birth control. We just loved sex. And I'm like, Grandma, shut up. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. She's like, no, you don't understand that commitment, that love for sex that we had. You don't understand. I'm like, what are you talking about, Grandma? And she's like, well, we had to risk getting pregnant. And if we did, we were going down a flight of stairs. How do you feel about that? <laughs> do you love sex that much? I'm like, no. I'm taking the pill. There's no reason I'm going to break my neck just because I don't want to have a little spawn. Scented pads, let's talk about them for a minute. Scented pads. I just don't understand why they exist. Why are they scented? Who's admiring the scent of your pad? <laughs> Who? Why? Who? And ladies, am I right? They don't fool the dog, do they? So, why don't they make an anti Rottweiler scented pad? That would be. How many times have you been at your buddy's house and like you're over there and like the dog's me normally tears up everything and you're sitting in the corner like this? I'm just really good with animals. It's good. Oh. I thought dogs like things like, I don't know, like eating garbage or like people food. No, my dog, Spring Meadows. My dog's a big fan of the summer breeze. This is my imaginary dog right here. Hi, puppy. It's my dog. I call my dog Poopy Face. But I have a dog, and I was trying to think of a good name for her. And I was like, well, she's fat, she's white, and she only humps women. I think Rosie will have to do. I think God does. I, you know what? You know what I have, everyone should have their own relationship with God, I think. And I do. Like, I know when God's trying to send me messages and stuff. Like, um, God was trying to tell me to get a job in one message by uh, breaking my vibrator. <laughs> He was like, Laura, you got to get out of the f house, honey. This is just wrong. <laughs> yep. Uh, my mom thinks I'm gay. This is exciting news. <laughs> exciting news. Doesn't say it to me. Doesn't say it to me. Says it to, well, pretty much my, the rest of my entire family. And uh, they're, they're having dinner. And I was working somewhere great. Like, I don't know, maybe here or something. I don't know where I was. And uh, she uh, says to my sister, she looks over and she goes, you know, Laura hasn't brought a guy home in a couple years. She uh, plays the guitar. She does stand-up comedy. And they were like, yeah? And then she was like, well, do you guys think she could be gay? My sister's like, I don't think you have to worry about Laura's sexuality, Mom. She's like, well, why not? Because she's a whore. <laughs> you know what the best part about that is? My mom goes, thank God. Oh. Who's poor here? Let me hear some poor people out there. Yeah, Christmas is coming up. That's a blast for us, huh? Returning bottles at Save-A-Lot so you can buy your family some nice detergent. <laughs> That's where I'm at, man. I'm so poor right now. I'm so poor. And it's so funny because like you can go like all day like without eating or something and then you'll fart and it smells good. Just me? Okay. I'm just, not me. I was just kidding. I was just throwing it out there, just seeing, just testing the waters on that one. Laura, that's just sick. Girl sparked. <laughs> Obviously, he had to fart. What's his name, the guy that just left? Where's he going? What's his name? Can, can they hear in the bathroom in here? Yeah. Mark, if someone's in there, you're going to have to wash your hands. <laughs> Pinch it off, brother. I know you don't want to wash your hands. <laughs> this is just sick. She made a poopy noise. <laughs> Are you guys having a good time so far? Are you guys having a good time? It's fun. 
<laughs> That's good. I was just curious. <laughs> You know what's really exciting for me? I'm from Detroit, okay? I, I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and uh, it's so funny when I, but it's so funny, like I get this when I travel around, they're like, oh my God, Lori, you're from Detroit. Wow, you are from a nice area of Detroit. <laughs> and I'm like, that's so cute, don't you get the news? <sighs> yeah, Detroit's beautiful this time of year. <laughs> get to drive real slow in the nice snow and people can jump right in your car and kill you. It's good. But I like this, though. I, I don't want to bash where I'm from, Detroit, because I love it. But, you know, I moved out of there. I moved out. I had to. It was weird. I had to go make new friends and stuff. Hi, Mark. You back? How's your ass feel? Can we get him a moist towelette for his little bean hole here? That's... Did you wash your hands? No, you just splash water on him. You, yeah, I know what you did in there. No one else was in there. He's like, splash. This is good. All I'm saying is if I didn't have the money, I'd move back there. <laughs> This is exciting though, because I moved from this. I moved from Detroit, a very, very cultural, multi-ethnic city. You guys may have seen this somewhere on like Discovery Channel or something, but I'll try and talk to you about it. It's very white here, and that's all white. <laughs> I love that. I took my mom to the doctor. She had something stuck in the cornea of her eye. Turns out it's a fork. <laughs> I'm not allowed to drink next Christmas. Where? <laughs> Whatever, what a baby. My dad was one of these dads that liked to take us to the haunted houses, scare the living out of us. He'd take me in there, I was like five years old, take me in there by my little hand, lead me into the middle of the haunted house, you know, where I couldn't find my way out or in or whatever. He'd let go of me, act like something was viciously attacking him, and start screaming, Laura, run, it's got my leg! And I'd be like, Dad, no! Because that's hysterical, isn't that funny? Isn't it? Well, I got him back when uh, he got his leg stuck in the wood chipper. I was like, I'm not falling for that one again, Dad. Sorry. It's got my leg. Yeah, right. I like to do this to my mom, too. This is my big favorite thing to do. Hey, Mom, you remember the time you grounded me for an entire year for smoking a cigarette? You do, huh? How about the time you traded my family vacation, or <laughs> you traded my spring break with a family vacation to the Uper tourist trap? Remember that? What's that? Oh, it must be hard for you to answer with me holding on to your oxygen tube. Oh. Oh. You guys, that's like eight hours of fun for me right there. That's a case of Bud Light and a good damn time. Oh, this poor girl. I'm going to get the show moving along here, I got I want to tell you guys this before I go. I hate to get kind of on a serious note here, and uh, but I'm just going to say this, and you guys, just think this over. Uh, oh, if you want, I got um, some stickers after the show. They're two bucks, and that's my only PSA I'll do. But here's the one that uh, really means a lot, okay? Um, when you guys are leaving here tonight, never give a job to an officer to get out of a ticket. <laughs> It is only going to get you pulled over at every intersection. <laughs> you guys, I was like an hour late and like half a pound heavier when I got here. That's some <laughs> That was pretty sick. Well, you guys have been great. My name's Laura Lou. Enjoy the rest.